Hey guys, it's Jen. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another video. So I am very excited to share today's video with you because it is a vintage cooking video. I've been wanting to make one of these for a while and so I'm very excited to share with you the meal that I will be making it tonight for my family. Uh, I am cooking it out of the Better Homes and Gardens new cookbook, which I believe is from, it's either 1953 or 1954. I think it's from 1954, I can't remember. Um, either way, I ordered it on eBay because I was, I really wanted an authentic one, and I think either my mom or my grandma had one, but I obviously wasn't gonna be like, hey, can I have your cookbook? <laughs> So if you're looking for one, eBay has a huge selection of vintage cookbooks if you're interested. So I'm actually going to be cooking a meal or like a menu plan straight out of the cookbook for my family of four. Uh, if you're new to my channel, welcome. Uh, I'm a full-time working mom. I have two kids, 10 and seven, and I love to cook. So before I share with you what I'm making tonight, I also wanted to say that today's video is a collaboration with Noelle from Noelle's Big Family Life. She was actually the one that gave me the idea to film this video and I was like, well, instead of just giving her credit, why don't I collab with her? She has an awesome YouTube channel. Uh, she actually has two YouTube channels. I think she has uh, a vlog channel and then she has another channel where she shares more of um, food for her large family. She has great vintage cooking videos, great meal prep videos, great uh, budget-friendly meals. So if you guys aren't already subscribed to her, be sure that you check out her channel because you will not be disappointed. Uh, she just shares lots of real life cooking and she's so relatable and I love watching her. And if you are coming from Noelle's channel, hi and welcome. I hope that you subscribe and uh, join in on the fun here on this channel. Okay, enough talking. Let me show you what we're gonna be making. All right, so this cookbook is actually in pretty decent condition for how old it is. Um, it has many tabs on uh, the outside here that sort of separate the book into sections. But what I am doing today is cooking a meal out of the uh, menu planning section. So it says, plan meals the easy way. Borrow these ideas. So when I was looking through these, I thought, you know what I haven't had forever is Swiss steak. And it's something that I can remember eating as a kid, my mom and my grandma cooking it and just thinking it was so delicious whenever we had it. So that's what I wanted to make. And I decided to go ahead and just follow the row all the way over. So for dinner tonight, I'm gonna be making Swiss steak. And then for the starch, I chose scalloped potatoes. For the vegetable, I'm choosing asparagus. For the salad, I'm doing the orange endive salad. Dessert, we're doing a jelly roll cake. And then nice to serve with it, we're gonna have some hot French bread. So I've gone through and found all the recipes in the cookbook here, which I have to say is kind of a challenge. Um, <laughs> it's funny, because you know we're used to cookbooks that just have pictures with every single recipe. Um, this is actually the Swiss steak recipe that I'm going to use and it's just funny because I literally had to search high and low <laughs> for this recipe in the cookbook because the index doesn't exactly work the same way as it does in modern cookbooks. But at any rate, uh, I'm going to take you along with me as I cook this meal and I will let you know uh, what we think of everything at the end. All right, so we are going to be starting with dessert first because that is what is going to take the longest. So for the jelly roll cake, uh, if you're not familiar with these types of recipes, another common one would be like the um, pumpkin roll cake that people make in the fall a lot of times. And essentially what you do is you just make a cake on a jelly roll pan. So it's a smaller, um, thinner cake and then when it comes out of the oven you roll it up in a clean kitchen towel and let it cool and that's what allows you to roll it around the filling so for this particular recipe it called for cake flour you can just get that in the regular grocery store by the baking supplies I happen to have some on hand for a different recipe that I uh, made a while back I can't remember what it was but anyway I had some on hand so I just sifted that together with um, some baking powder and some salt and then set that aside. 
This particular recipe also calls for separating the eggs. So I just have four eggs that I have let come to room temperature on the counter. And I think the easiest way to separate eggs is just to use clean hands. That's what I use. I don't really use a special egg separator or anything. So uh, go ahead and set the whites aside. And then I'm putting the yolks in a big bowl and Connor really wanted to help me use the hand mixer. So I'm mixing the egg yolks with the sugar until the, that is nice and creamy and like a light yellow color. I also added a little bit of vanilla to that. Um, I did use my hand mixer for this part because you'll see here in a little bit, I have to whip the egg whites and I'll be using my stand mixer for that part. really tried also to get out some of my vintage dishes while I was cooking this meal. So that yellow Pyrex bowl is one that got passed down to me from my grandma. And I love the Pyrex dishes, especially the old colored ones. So you'll see some of those pop up here throughout the video. So for the egg whites, you want to just make sure that your utensils like your bowl and your whisk are super clean so that your egg whites will um, beat up. You want to beat them until they come to stiff peaks. So uh, I am I'm slowly also adding the sugar to the mixing bowl as those beat up and don't over mix them but make sure that they are stiff that way your cake will set up properly so once you have the egg whites beaten up you're just going to gently fold in the egg yolk mixture so whenever i'm folding something in and it looks like i'm doing it really like rapidly here but obviously i have this video sped up um, anyway i just like to use a rubber spatula so I'm just folding in the egg yolks and the flour mixture as gently as I can. Um, you want to try not to deflate the egg whites, but obviously make sure that you get everything mixed together. So I have a jelly roll pan here. This is a 15 by 10 um, size pan. I've lined it with parchment paper that I sprayed with cooking spray. And then I'm just going to spread out the batter onto the pan as evenly as I can and get that in the oven. If I didn't mention this already, I will have all of these recipes um, typed out in the description box below if you guys would like to make them for yourself. Obviously, I can't link them because <laughs> they are not online. So I'm going to pop this into the oven. Uh, the recipe said to cook it at 375 for um, about 12 minutes. I probably should have taken it out a couple minutes beforehand, but that was fine. Just keep that in mind to check on it if you decide to make this recipe. Okay, so after the cake comes out, you want to turn it out onto a clean kitchen towel that has been sprinkled with powdered sugar. So I just used a small sift, sift, sieve to sprinkle an even layer of powdered sugar. You wanna make sure that you don't skip that, otherwise the cake um, could possibly stick to the towel. The powdered sugar keeps it from doing that. Um, so then you just turn out your cake onto your clean towel very carefully. Don't burn yourself. Uh, peel off the parchment paper, and then you will also sprinkle that with a little bit more uh, powdered sugar. And I think I also put another layer of parchment paper, or actually I use wax paper in there, I think when I rolled it up just to make sure that the cake didn't stick to itself. So I have made these types of cakes before, um, the pumpkin roll cake one. So if you guys have seen that recipe, it's like a pumpkin cake that's rolled with cream cheese frosting. Really good. I should make one again this year. But essentially, once that's rolled up, just set it aside until it is cool while you make the filling. So this cookbook had several different filling recipes. Um, I decided to go with chocolate just because that was probably the one that was going to be the most popular in my house. Essentially, what you're doing is making like a cooked custard or like a homemade chocolate pudding. So in the back um, pot there, I have some milk that I'm scalding. So just take some milk and heat it up on the stove and then add your unsweetened chocolate. Once that is all mixed together and melted, then I'm pouring that into my flour and sugar mixture that I have on a double boiler. So I don't have a proper double boiler. Um, all I do is use a glass bowl over a pot of simmering water. So you're gonna cook this for 15 minutes, which I thought was kind of a long time. And mine actually didn't 
thicken up quite as well as I thought it would. Um, it tasted really, really good. Like the chocolate flavor, you could tell it was like a homemade chocolate, delicious, you know, <laughs> sauce. Um, it just didn't thicken up quite as well as I wanted it to. So the last step is to um, temper your eggs. So I have some eggs that are mixed in a bowl. Pour some of the hot liquid into there, stir it around, and then pour the whole mixture back into um, your bowl. This just makes sure that the eggs don't scramble when you add the eggs to the hot liquid. So I'm gonna continue to cook that for about five minutes. I'll also add some vanilla. And then when it is done and thickened up, I'll go ahead and pop it in the refrigerator to cool. And then when it's cool and my cake's cool, I'll show you how I put that all together. All right, so I left this in the refrigerator until it was completely cooled through. You can kind of see, I think the intention was for it to be a pudding consistent consistency. It was sort of a little bit thinner than that. It was fine, it still tasted good, it worked out. So I'm just unrolling the cake and then I'm pouring my chocolate filling over it and then I'll carefully roll it up and put it on my platter. Since I sort of had like a chocolate sauce rather than a thick filling, um, I went ahead and poured the rest of it over the top of the cake and it did end up working out fine. I have made cooked custards before for different pies and so it's not like I haven't successfully done it before. I'm not sure what happened this time. Um, but either way, it tasted delicious and the kids were happy with it. So there is the completed cake. We'll be having that for dessert. So uh, the next thing that I'm going to work on is going to be the scallop potatoes. So these will actually cook in the oven along with the Swiss steak. And I've made scallop potatoes before, um, homemade ones, but I used a different recipe. And I have to say, this recipe for scallop potatoes was delicious. If I make them again, I will definitely be using this recipe. So if you guys like these, make sure that you um, copy or screenshot that recipe and make these because you won't regret it. So I have six medium potatoes that I have washed and scrubbed and I'm just going to go ahead and peel those. I guess technically you wouldn't have to peel your potatoes, but um, I, I, I really like to peel mine when I make scallop potatoes and mashed potatoes, but obviously it's a personal preference. So once you get these all peeled, um, you can go ahead and slice them up. You could use a mandolin slicer. Um, I didn't get mine out. I just used a knife, which you'll see here in a little bit. Um, optional, you can also add a little bit of shredded cheese to the sauce that you're going to make for the scallop potatoes. In my opinion, cheese is not optional, so you can bet that I'm adding it. So to make the sauce for the scallop potatoes, you're just going to make a white sauce. So I have some butter and flour in my pan here and I'm just going to cook that together and add some milk. So I think I used um 2% milk or maybe I tried maybe I used whole milk. I can't yeah, I used whole milk. I couldn't remember. Um, but once the flour and butter is cooked together, I added some salt and pepper, and then I am just um, adding my milk. And you basically just wanna simmer that, make sure that you stir it frequently so it doesn't burn on the bottom of the pan, but just cook it together until the sauce thickens and then you can add the cheese. This sauce will not be super thick, and that's totally fine. Obviously, uh, it will absorb into the potatoes as they cook in the oven, so it doesn't have to be super thick, you know, like a macaroni and cheese sauce would be or something like that. So I'm just gonna get my potatoes sliced up. Um, I'm using my trusty chef's knife, and uh, I'm gonna slice those up as thin as I can, layering them in my casserole dish. So I just have a 13 by nine casserole dish that I sprayed with cooking spray and then I'm going to do three layers of potatoes with some minced onion and the sauce in between. So I'm going to do one layer of potatoes, um, season it, put some chopped onion in there, some sauce, and then repeat that until the whole dish is full. So I am using some sharp white cheddar cheese um, and a little bit of shredded regular cheddar cheese to add to the sauce. Like I said, the recipe said this is optional, but I would definitely recommend adding it. And you don't even really need that much cheese. I would just say about um, a cup for the whole pan. Thank you. 
so you saw me get my first layer in the pan there. Another thing I wanted to mention is when you're making a dish like this, just make sure that you try to cut all of your potatoes the same thickness so that they all cook evenly. You don't want like chunks of uncooked potato in your dish. And you also saw me adding a little bit of minced onion to this. Um, it really gives the dish a lot of flavor and once everything cooks together, you can't even tell that the onions are in there. And I know this because my kids ate this without complaint. And if they would have detected chunks of onion, they probably wouldn't have. So uh, after you get your last layer in there, you can just pour the rest of the sauce over and um, just sort of flatten it down and then you're going to cover it with foil and bake it in the oven for about an hour. Um, this is what it looked like after an hour and then I went ahead and took the foil off and let it brown the rest of the way. So okay next thing I'm going to show you is Swiss steak. So you can see mine got a little crispy around the edges. I have some recommendations for that coming up here which I'll share with you. So I have some round steak here. Um, this I actually got from Walmart in the meat section and then I just cut it up into individual um, steaks and I'm pounding it with a meat mallet. I think I got my meat mallet at Ikea. I can't remember for sure though. These were already pretty thin so I didn't really need to thin them out. I just pounded them to tenderize them a little bit. And so next I'm going to make my seasoned flour. So you'll just combine flour, salt, and pepper. And that is what you will use to dredge the steaks in before you fry them. You can see here that I ran out of <laughs> peppercorns in my pepper grinder, so I had to replace that. Um, if you've never had Swiss steak before, it's basically, um, you can use round steak or chuck steak that's been tenderized and then uh, you dredge that in seasoned flour and fry it up in a pan and then you add tomatoes and onions and put it in the oven to slow cook. So I think where this recipe may have gone a little bit better for me was that the steaks, I, I should have found some thicker round steak. Um, that probably would have kept mine from burning a little bit around the edges, but at any rate, it was still good. We ate it. See Murphy's nose. <laughs> okay. So the, the recipe says to brown this in hot fat. So I just used some shortening that I had in my pantry. I'm just covering those, uh, steaks with the flour mixture, shaking off the excess. And then you don't have to cook these all the way through. Obviously this is going to go in the oven. And so you just want to crisp up the meat on both sides and then remove Move it to a plate while you do the rest of yours. I think I made six total. I added a little bit more shortening to make sure that nothing burned on the bottom. Uh, and I'm using my Dutch oven. So this is a large Dutch oven and they're for Dutch ovens. They're pretty inexpensive. I'll link this one below. Um, Adam got it for me on Amazon. I really love it. Um, I tend to use it a lot more, especially in the fall and winter months. <laughs> Okay, so after the steaks are browned, I'm going to add one chopped onion to the pot and let that cook just a little bit with some salt and pepper until the onion starts to soften. Soften. You don't have to cook it all the way, obviously. This is gonna go in the oven. Um, and then next, I'm going to add a can of diced tomatoes. So uh, when I was cooking these recipes, I wanted to follow the cookbook exactly. I didn't wanna make any of like my own, you know, modifications or substitutions just because I really wanted to make sure that these were as authentic as possible. In hindsight, my gut told me, you know, you should add some more liquid to that pot since you're gonna cook this for 90 minutes in the oven. But alas, I didn't. I should have added a can of beef broth um, because as you'll see, when I took them out of the oven, the edges got a little burnt and crispy. We still salvaged them and everything tasted great, but just if you're gonna make this in the future, I would definitely consider adding some more liquid to the pot, even some water would work if you didn't have beef broth on hand. So here I am getting everything into the oven to cook together. Here's what the steak looked like after it was out of the oven. I'm so sorry for the burnt edges, but you can see actually in the middle that it was not burnt and 
the kids actually really liked it. So uh, next is just some steamed asparagus. So this is not a fancy recipe or anything. I'm just cooking this, or I'm sorry, steaming it in a skillet with some water and adding some butter and salt and pepper to it. So to clean my asparagus, I'm using my salad spinner. Uh, just soaking that with some vinegar to make sure that's good and clean. And then I added it to a skillet. I'll pour about a cup of water in the bottom and just steam that for about five minutes. Make sure that you don't overcook it. And then I put some butter and salt and pepper. Okay, so lastly, I'm going to show you the orange endive salad. So this was probably the recipe I was most interested in trying. Um, it was pretty unique, and I would make it again, I think, with a few modifications. So I'm going to make the dressing first. I made this ahead of time and put it in the fridge so all the flavors could combine. I'm making it in a mason jar just so I can shake it up and store it. Uh, I have some olive oil, some tarragon vinegar, um, it said one clove of garlic, so I'm just using a little bit of garlic paste and then some salt. The other ingredient is paprika, so I'm going to add that. That gives it kind of a nice red color, and then I'll just put the lid on and shake that up. Oh, I forgot. I have to add some sugar, too. I almost, I almost forgot a teaspoon of sugar. Um, anyway, so shake that up, and then I'm going to store it in the refrigerator until it is time to mix the salad. Um, I think if I made this again, I would cut down on the salt in the dressing or just use less of the dressing on the salad. Um, it still was really good, though, and actually my kids both ate this salad and liked it. So it calls for two oranges sectioned, so I'm just going to cut the ends off the oranges, stand them up, and peel them. Uh, if you've never done this before, it's kind of a fun technique to cut oranges for a salad. Um, I'm just using my knife to cut out sections of that, and you want to make sure you do this over a bowl so that you can save all the juice because you don't want to lose that. I ended up mixing it in with my salad and it was really good. So I'm just going to get these oranges um, sectioned and then next we'll do the greens. Another thing I wanted to mention is once you get all of the sections cut out of the orange, if you just squeeze the remainder of it, you'll get all the juice out so that you don't waste any. So there are my sectioned oranges. Okay, so I kind of had to search for this curly endive. Um, I think it's also known as frise, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I did end up finding this at Hy-Vee. My Walmart did not carry it, uh, but I'm going to wash this in the same way that I wash all of my other greens, which is with my OXO salad spinner. So I'm just cutting this into fairly small pieces with my knife, and then I'll pop that into the salad spinner, squeeze some lemon juice over the top. The lemon juice helps to not only clean the greens, but it will also help keep them from browning when you store these later in the refrigerator. So sometimes I get questions on when do I use vinegar? When do I use lemon juice? As a general rule, I use lemon juice when I'm washing salad greens and vinegar when I'm washing anything else. So just let this sit in the cold water and sort of rehydrate, get nice and clean, and then I will spin it dry. Uh, I, you guys probably get tired of me saying this, but you know, there's always new people watching. And so if I mention products in my videos, I always try and link them in the description box below because it's so much easier um, rather than you guys having to like ask me in the comments and then reply. So uh, you can see how much water I got out of that. So I am going to pop these greens back in the refrigerator for now, just because I wasn't quite ready to assemble the salad yet. All right, so now it's time to assemble the salad right before dinner. I'm using one of my vintage pink Pyrex bowls that I love so much. 
I put the greens in the bottom of the bowl and I'm going to be serving everything family style at the table. Um, the kids thought this was really fun. And in fact, we've been doing this ever since <laughs> every night we've been eating family style around the table. It's been really fun to do that. So, uh, I am putting some red onion in the salad. I believe this called for a uh, Bermuda onion. I was totally out of onions. This was the only one I had. So it was either this or nothing. Um, but I do think the red onion was really good in the salad, especially with the orange. So I'm going to pour my sectioned oranges over the top, shake up my dressing and then drizzle that on. Like I said, if I had to do it again, I probably wouldn't have used all the dressing or served it on the side, but Either way, this was really good and unique. I think the flavor combination uh, was unique as well. So there was our salad. And then the last thing is just to get the bread warmed up. So the accompaniment that this particular dinner called for was French bread. So I just had some that I bought sliced from Walmart and I'm just going to wrap it in some foil. I'll give Murphy a bite <laughs> and then I'll pop this in the oven to warm up and serve it with some butter. All right, so here's what we ended up for with for dinner. So we got scalloped potatoes. Those look good. Asparagus, uh, some orange endive salad, and the Swiss steak, which I'm a little concerned about because I feel like it burned around the edges um, a bit, but we'll try to salvage it. And then I have some French bread in here that I warmed up with some butter, and then we will have um, chocolate jelly roll cake for dessert. All right, what do you think about the cake? It doesn't even look like a cake. I know. It kind of looks like... A blob. A blob, yeah. All right, I'll slice you off a piece and see if it's good. I'm sure it's good. I, I actually tasted the chocolate cream. It, it tasted legit. Like, that's, a, that's the thing is when you make like stuff from scratch it's like very rich tasting mm. really good yeah even though it doesn't look that great it's still good mm -hmm. That's <laughs> delicious. okay all right so that was super fun let me um share with you guys what everyone thought of all the recipes that i cooked tonight so the swiss steak uh I think that this is like a traditional Swiss steak recipe. I feel like maybe the round steak that I got was a little bit too thin and I also feel like I didn't add enough liquid in with um, the steak and the tomatoes and the onions. And so we all ate it and thought it was good. But next time I would try to buy thicker round steak and I would definitely add like maybe a can of beef broth to the pot so that I didn't get like the burning and the crisping around the edges. The scalloped potatoes, were delicious. This recipe is definitely a keeper. Um, if I didn't mention before, I will have all these recipes typed out down below so you guys can also make them if you want. Um, but winner, winner, chicken dinner. Love the scalloped potatoes. Uh, the asparagus was good. Nothing fancy there, just buttered asparagus. The orange endive salad, um, for the most part, we liked it. Everyone actually tried it. Connor really liked the oranges in it, so did Adam. Uh, we maybe thought that the dressing was... I don't know, just a little bit too salty, and there was maybe too much dressing for the amount of greens, and so just be careful of that as you're putting it on the salad if you're gonna dress it ahead of time. Um, the jelly roll cake, <laughs> I don't know, guys. This one was hard for me. Like, I have made cooked cream custards before. Like, I've made homemade banana cream pie, homemade, um, what do I call it? Oh, lemon meringue pie. And I've never had a problem with my custard not setting up, but this chocolate cream did not set up very well. Um, so if I was gonna make that again, I might try to make like a whipped frosting to go in the middle. And also I feel like the cake was just a tiny bit overcooked. Um, the, the chocolate had like an awesome flavor. I mean, obviously everyone ate it without complaint, so it's not like it was a total loss, uh, but I might do those few things differently next time. And then obviously the French bread with butter. Kind of hard to screw that up when you buy the bread at the store. So uh, that is it for today's video. I had such a fun time doing this. I love vintage cooking. I love vintage cookbooks. And if you guys want to see more of these, please let me know. So thanks for watching and I'll see you on my next video. Bye.